You're listening to the Elephant in the Room property podcast, where the big things that never get talked about actually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent and co-host of Fox Hills Location, Location, Location Australia. And I'm Chris Bates, financial planner, mortgage broker and wealth coach. And together, we're going to uncover who's really making the decisions when you buy a property. Veronica will introduce our guests in a moment. And I can tell you that you want to listen on because it's a bit of a different episode. We've actually got two guests. And what we talk about is engineering and just how important it is for everything that goes on in our lives. And in particular around residential construction and just how dangerous it is. Because in New South Wales, anyone can call themselves an engineer. To change a light bulb or a fuse... You need to have a qualified electrician come and do that. And in New South Wales, they have to be licensed and qualified. To fix a leaking tap, the plumber has to be licensed and qualified. To build the road network in New South Wales, maintain the road network, our water supply, or any of these residential buildings, you don't need a qualification. Please stick around for this week's Elephant Rider Boot Camp. And we have a cracking Dumbo of the Week coming up. Before we get started... Everything we talk about on this podcast is general in nature and should never be considered to be personal financial advice. If you're looking to get advice, please seek the help of a licensed financial advisor or buyer's agent. They will tailor and document their advice to your personal circumstances. Now let's get cracking. In this episode, we're going to address one of the biggest elephants in the room so far in this podcast, and it relates to the safety, build quality, the financial well-being of apartment owners, and the potential for devastating tragedy if nothing is done about it. But that's got your, your ears pricked up. This is something that I didn't know until recently, that in Australia, engineers don't have to be registered. In fact, pretty much anyone can call themselves an engineer. Now, how this plays out is that when we have an infrastructure and a building boom, coupled with hurried design, approval, construction and compliance processes, people working in the sector may not actually be qualified to do the work. Now, we only have to mention Opal Tower let alone Grenfell Tower or Lacrosse Tower, to start imagining the consequences. Now, today joining us are two people. So we've got um, a bit more, a few more voices in today's podcast. First of all, we have a farmer who's in Sydney talking about engineering. <laughs> Welcome, John Roydhouse. Would you like to introduce yourself? Good morning, Veronica and Chris. Um, yes, I'm John Roydhouse and I am the CEO of the Institute of Public Works Engineering Australasia, New South Wales Division, and that is a mouthful. Um, IPWEA for short is how we like to refer ourselves. We're a professional membership organisation looking after the interests of public works engineering, so all the public infrastructure around New South Wales. That's primarily local government, but also gets into the private consultancy and state government, doing everything outside the actual building um, of the residential towers that you've already referred to in the Opal Tower. So the water going in, the footpaths, the roads, all the transport and the waste coming out. Which is something we all forget really needs to be attached to the buildings we live in in order to make it comfortable to live in. And our other guest uh, is Jonathan Russell, who works with Engineers Australia, the peak body for engineering profession, right? That's right. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thanks, Veronica. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so my name is Jonathan Russell. I work for Engineers Australia. It's a professional association. It, uh, it is related to the Institute of Public Works Engineer Australasia in the sense that we cover engineers as well, but we cover the full breadth of engineers and engineering practice in, in Australia. So that includes um, public works uh, activities as well as civil construction, but also electrical uh, Defence engineering, mm-hmm. uh, biomedical engineering, the full the full gamut. Now, all of this does impact every one of us every single day. Now, obviously, for the purpose of this podcast, we're going to focus on the residential construction side of things. But you know, the implications of of the sorts of things that you're going to reveal to us today are widespread. So we don't want to limit it totally to residential and and, and narrow down the conversation if we should be talking about bigger picture stuff. So Mm -hmm. let's get stuck into this chat. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, John and Jonathan. Um, I mean, it's it's brilliant to have you both here, actually, because, you know, with construction, we always like to blame someone or we always like to, you know, blame the builder or blame the council, et cetera. And, you know, you two are complementing, I guess, the two important parts is the actual building and also the infrastructure around that building, which makes it, you know, it all, all worthwhile. I guess I'm a bit flabbergasted, I mean, around the engineers and, you know, what it takes to actually call yourself an engineer and, you know, I guess the dangers in in not having, you know, rules around that. Can you explain what do you need 
have to call yourself an engineer? In New South Wales, and I believe that's where most of your listeners are, yeah. it's uh, frightening small. You don't have to prove anything. Uh, anyone can call themselves an engineer in New South Wales. And that includes with uh, the apartment towers or the civil construction. In You introduced at the beginning, Veronica, that engineers don't need to be registered anywhere in Australia. Now, there are shades of grey around the country. Queensland has a great system that we think. Since 1930, to be provide engineering services, you do have to be registered. Mm. You do have to actually pass a degree, have experience, and then demonstrate that you're a fit and proper person. In Victoria, where I understand a lot of your listeners are as well, in the residential um, construction arena, there are some categories of engineer which need to be registered, but then you move north across the Murray River to, to New South Wales, and you know legally anyone can, uh, can get involved. Um, so what we're, we're calling for is that, that that just doesn't make sense. I mean, we're going to talk about a Dumbo later. I think that's a fairly big Dumbo. That is yeah. a Dumbo, yep. <laughs> and I guess, um, you know, where does an engineer kind of, because I do a lot of work with all of my clients are actually working in construction and I mm. kind of understand the process and et cetera, but where does engineers mainly come into the construction process mm -hmm. and where do the problems start? So there are engineers involved in so engineers are involved in pretty much everything, all parts of life. In this studio, sound studio, for example, there'll be engineers involved in making the microphones work. In a building, it's much more obvious because engineers design and then build, construct the, 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 the building. But a building is also like a system. So you don't just have a structural engineer doing the drawings for how to um, make it go up vertically. You've also got fire safety engineers to make sure that um, the cladding is safe. And that's another big topic that's been going around for a mm. few years now, mm. that the fire escapes are all work from an engineering and a human si um, sort of social science point of view as well. You've got the, the waste that John mentioned before that needs to come out of the building, mechanical services engineers, the air conditioning, the refrigeration engineers. So there's an engineer is going to be involved in designing pretty much all of the building. Mm -hmm. And then once the design is made, there are engineers involved in actually following the designs and then constructing it, putting it up. And uh, so they're the two main ways that I think it's easy to conceive what engineers do in, in this, in the residential arena. And is on it, the end of that, is there engineers who are signing off on it or is that a separate role? Okay. So from a, so in Queensland, if you're going to be providing engineering services and you're going to be signing off on the work, then you're going to need to be registered. In New South Wales, there are still going to be people signing off on the work. It's like any other a uh, company would have a risk management process in place. So the, the big design consultancy will have senior engineers supervising jun more junior engineers and signing off on their work. And then there'll be people at construction site who are supervising the work. The gap in the system in New South Wales is that there's no system for quality, quality control. And where issues are identified, there's no mechanism to um, uh, deal with a, an individual who's not up to task and providing sanctions to either re-educate or remove them from the system entirely. It, it, unlike a medical, like a medical doctor, someone makes a complaint and then they, you realise that they're not competent, so mm. they shouldn't be practising as a doctor. Mm. They're removed from the system. They can't do it anymore. With engineering, it would be possible for someone who, who was dodgy enough to keep on moving through the system. I, I guess the, the, the key point is you can look at an engineering function and there's a pure engineer and then there's a technician and we do need to separate those and a lot of mm. the functions are being done by a technician not by an engineer what an engineer has to do is they have to do the design they have to do it to certain standards in fact the engineers write the standards and that's one of the key things and in doing that they're assessing risk all the time and that's part of their professional standing is to assess the risk. What, what is the satisfactory level of risk in doing that? And if I design it in such and such a way, what's actually going to happen? And that is the big distinction that we're seeing is there, there's a lot of people who've got the technical expertise, but they're not qualified to do the actual function. So when you say the technician, what do you mean by that? A technician can be everyone from a construction worker through to a paraprofessional, someone learning the trade. They're certainly not qualified to sign off, but they're actually out there doing the job. And that's the problem we see in New South Wales a lot, whether it's in private construction or in public infrastructure. So the design's good, but then potentially the build and the sign off isn't happening by the engineers, it's happening by technicians and they're not really kind of double checking what the engineer 
tried to achieve in the first place. The, the, you do have that risk. It was really interesting. I ran a development engineering forum last October in Sydney, and that was local government engineers who are involved with the development application process and doing the assessments, everything for local councils. It was private certifiers who in New South Wales do have to be qualified to sign off on, on, private, sort of, on private construction, and property developers and some large property developers all wanted to do the right thing, but all were looking back towards the engineers to actually write those standards. And then the private certifiers are saying, we can then do our job if we know what those consistent, concise standards are. Property developers want to do the right thing, but again, they are looking for standards to be set. So now I know it's going to be really difficult for you guys to comment on Opal Tower because there's a massive investigation going on and, of course, it might take years to work out really what you know, the root of the cause was, and I'm sure it was never not one thing as well. I'm sure there's a complicated web of things. But in a general sense, how can that sort of thing go wrong? How can that happen? The final report into the Opal Tower incident came out in uh, February, so just a few weeks ago. And um, they found what it seemed to the, to the investigators happened is that there was, the building was designed, but then the as-built building wasn't to the high enough spec. And so there's still, as you say, they're still trying to unpick yeah. what really went wrong. Mm. But it appears that the design might, may have been right, but then the way it was constructed wasn't to the exact design. Right. It's what John was saying. You had mm. people who didn't perhaps even understand the design yeah. fully mm. um, to be able to actually apply it. Now, one of the recommend, there were sort of three main recommendations that came out of the Opal Tower report. And... Uh, they're not new recommendations. And I'll go into that. <laughs> I'm sure they're yeah. not. And the report authors said that if these three recommendations had already been in place, then the chances of Opal Tower happening would have been much, much reduced, if not eliminated. And so the first one was to register engineers uh, so that you can identify someone who is competent and there's a higher, there's, it acts as a risk management framework. It encourages people to maintain their continuing professional development mm -hmm. uh, and they're obviously going to have to be experienced so that unless, until you're at a certain level of experience, you can't be registered. The second thing was to have all the designs checked by a third party, independent third party. Mm -hmm. Now, big design houses uh, probably well, do this sort of in-house, like they get a different team to, to do yeah. a third-party review, but the report suggesting that independent third-party reviews would provide an extra level of rigour. So you get a completely disinterested party, if you like, to mm. check it off. And the third thing was to have uh, more, more and more formal stages of inspection so that when it comes time to pour the slab, you have someone who understands the design come over and watch and check that, all right, this is how we actually want it, this is how we intended it to be poured. And then when they're sort of putting the building up at certain stages, checking that, okay, this is actually being constructed in the way that was intended, therefore is going to be, is going to be safe. Mm. The, the, the two key things coming out of that final report was, number one, the registration of engineers. There's been very clear and has come through several reports over many years that we need to introduce that in, in the state of New mm. South Wales. Queensland's had it since 2002 um, by legislation and Victoria did introduce the legislation uh, in 2018. It went through the lower house, got through two reading speeches of the upper house and their state election got in the road, so it didn't get to the final reading speech. I do understand that the Victorian Treasurer who introduced the original legislation has made the commitment to reintroduce it into this term of Parliament. So hopefully we will see it in Victoria. New South Wales is dragging the chain. The second part is, as Jonathan was just saying, is the technicians that I referred to that are doing the work, the, the pouring the concrete and things, having someone on site to actually understand and be able to read the plans and understand and again, train them up to actually be the next generation of engineers. So actually instilling professional development and training into those people as well is really important. And I mean, I guess the, you know, the, one of the recommendations you said there is get an independent party to look over the plans. I mean, there's a cost to that. So, of course. you know, and, you know, there's another additional cost to the cost of the apartment. And, you know, a builder's not going to want to pay that. And mm. that's going to mean they're going to have to sell it for more money. And, so I guess, you know, there's a lot of people who won't want that, you know, and mm. I guess the independent review of, you know, these professionals, if, if you're in a construction boom, you know, construction salaries have already gone up, 
ridiculous amount in this boom. <laughs> um, and that's to everyone, everyone who's in the construction industry. Um, I mean, how do you, with, with building this amount of apartments, is there actually enough talent that is actually certified to actually, you know, go it, around basically? When it comes to engineers, I'd say, yes, there is. There is enough talent. Um, there are about... 330,000 engineers in the labour force at the moment. Now, not all of those are in the, the residential construction area, but construction across the broader range of uh, sort of disciplines is the third largest employer for engineers. So there are an awful lot of, lot of mm. them out there. Um, and then to whether there's a cost benefit analysis that, that needs to be done. Mm. So Opal Tower, it would have cost more to go slower and have more checks and make sure that the, the person building it could actually do it to the design. Yeah. But the benefit of, you know, to why that cost is that you didn't have an evacuation. You don't have a building that's going to have a question mark over it for, for the rest of its term. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Because, you know, one of the constant themes through this, this podcast is this idea of people are chasing short-term gains and they're not thinking about the long-term. Mm. And this is an absolute classic example of that where you don't want to pay too much for your apartment, but, oh, hell, mm. I, you know, those... I mean, there's been certain figures banded around around the values of those now, and to say that they've dropped in value by seventy five to eighty percent. I mean, even then, you say, well, who would buy one even at mm. even at eighty percent discount? Well, no bank would lend on it. Well, so, there's you know, there's a whole. Yes. So you can't buy it unless you've got all cash. Mm. Um, I may be showing my age, but when I went to school, I was taught you do things right the first time. Mm. Yes, and I think that's really important. And there are stats floating around that when the new New buildings, that seven out of ten have defects mm. at, at the time of purchase. That's not acceptable, and that's adding to the cost long term for anyone that wants to buy into residential real estate. If they're not buying something that's up to the specification or standard when they're purchasing it, and then it has to come and rectify, it's a lot more expensive to rectify after something's being built than getting it right the first time. And I, I hate to be political, but we're seeing that with the Sydney stadiums at the moment. Yeah, and the debate around those, which will be decided at the election, mm. the election coming up, obviously, but well, I mean, we didn't the, get it right the first time. That's the problem, really. I mean, we're building housing stock to sell, um, and the biggest way to sell it is to make it cheap. And because, you know, when you're you know, some, an investor, mainly mm. investor buys these apartments, not really home buyers, and investors go around, they shop the market, and they'll go to three or four, and... And one bed's four forty five at this pace, and it's four hundred and eighty at the mm. other one, or five twenty at the other one. Then maybe the five twenty one is the best building, but the investor says, "Oh, it should be good enough. I'll just go for the four hundred forty five thousand dollar one. Mm. Um, it's nearby. I'll get the same rent." Um, and so what we do is, you know, we self fulfill, you know, and basically buy the cheap building. And I mean, and that's kind of the problem here is the developer isn't incentivized to d make a better product because yeah. the consumer won't pay it. Well, I think, uh, so I mentioned that those recommendations weren't new mm. um, from the Opal Tower. So a year and a bit ago, the Council of Australian Government's Building Ministers Forum uh, had a report delivered to it that it commissioned. For your listeners, the Council of Australian Governments is a forum of the Prime Minister and the Premier of every state and uh, territory who get together and talk about big cross-jurisdictional policy issues. Building Ministers Forum is a subset of that, where it's the minister of each of those jurisdictions who's responsible for buildings. And so the BMF commissioned an investigation into the building and construction sector to the regulation of it and the enforcement of those regulations. And so a year ago, one of the, well, recommendation one was register engineers. And amongst the other 24 recommendations was one to have these more stages of inspection or more standardised and more tightly enforced stages of inspection. So they're exactly the same as the Opal Tower report yeah. recommendations. So you're right, there, there may be less incentive for developers to bother with the, the, the stages of inspection. Uh, and I'm not saying that uh, when we talk to, say, the property council, they're totally on board with us about mm. what needs to change. So I, it's, I wouldn't want your listeners to think that I'm saying all the developers are, are avoiding no. their responsibilities. Yeah, exactly. um, but uh, if the government's introduced this as a, as a rule, then it kind of takes the choice away from any levels developer of, that doesn't want to. Levels of yeah. playing field. Mm. I mean, and, and I think that's the issue, isn't it? It does have to come top down in this case because yeah. consumers clearly aren't going to demand it. They're uninformed consumers. <laughs> they yeah. are uninformed. Like and how, that's... how could they possibly know? 
yeah. you know, if the building's been put up properly. Oh, yeah. They can't. And you say, John, they're about, you know, some stats around about four out of, um, sorry, seven out of ten new buildings have defects. And certainly I've been talking to a lot of people over the years and we've interviewed people in the strata sector here as well and talking about very similar things and that, you know, people buy brand new not expecting it to have major problems and yet the proportion of major problems in new is much higher than it is in existing buildings. So they seem to think that age causes problems, not actual the building itself or the structure of the building. And and so that's a really important message that needs to get out there, but it's not sexy, hmm. you know, whereas glossy brochures are. It, it isn't sexy. Uh, property developers, I think, in the main do want to do the right thing, hmm. but they have to meet market expectations. So they're looking, how, how do we do that? Because we've got to make housing affordable. Uh, we want to attract investment. So how do we do that? And unfortunately... Um, we don't always see standards being maintained. Yeah, and I guess the, I mean, the developer game is a, it's high risk. If you're a developer, mm. you're not, uh, you know, this isn't just, you know, I would run a shop and I'll just have the customers every day. You've got to put a lot of money in. You've got a lot of time the market. And if, if it goes wrong, you lose a lot of money. And unfortunately, when they start to get problems with buildings is, you know, they've it, it, sometimes the builder and the developer is separate as well. Mm. And, you know, you start getting to a point where, you know, there are problems and, you know, sometimes it's like we just got to get this finished. And so Opal's one example that's mm. come out. But do you believe that there's a lot more <laughs> Opal towers out there that haven't come out? Because end of the day, if you live in that building and you see defects, the mm. last thing you want if you own that building is to get that to get on the strata report and mm. that to become public knowledge. And so do you think that a lot of the stuff is kind of hidden away in a lot of these buildings that people don't want to discuss? They may not all be as dramatic as a loud bang on Christmas Eve and being kicked out of the building, uh, but there are a lot of buildings that have serious issues. In the ACT, the government there is in the middle of, or the, so the Legislative Assembly is in, a, in the middle of doing a, an inquiry into the construction sector in the ACT. Uh, engineers are trying to put in one submission, there'll be plenty of others. And what some of our members are saying is that construction, that residential construction in the ACT for the past 10 years has led to an awful lot of substandard buildings. Nothing's going bang in the middle of the night, but there are plenty that have got, you know, they're getting, they're leaky or they're getting mm. mold issues or they're just little niggly things go wrong, which actually make them, if not uninhabitable, then far, of far less value than you thought they were when you mm. forked out half a million dollars. Um, the same members say that there are good developers and, and, and builders in, in the ACT as well, but it goes to, we, this idea of having registration is about also about trust. Yeah. If you are uh, and confidence, so if you're entering a, a market which you think is overheated, everyone's working working too fast, the checks aren't being done, that's going to lower the the potential value to, of the apartments because the general consumer base is going to be less confident mm. that this is actually a good investment for me. Mm. Maybe I will look at snapping up a, a building from 1930 that all the all the issues have been shaken out of that one mm. and just do a little reno job. Maybe that's a better option. So th these are the things that um, that I, that I think. Any builder, engineer, developer, or anyone else who's thinking about maybe cutting a corner or going too fast needs to think about it. It's about trust and confidence in the market. I think one of the issues with, you know, because it's quite complex. I mean, the fact is that we see a lot of developers building stock that we call investor stock, right? And so what that means is that it, they've just carved up their airspace into the maximum amount of apartments that they can have yeah. and the maximum amount of profit. And look, hats off at the end of the day they're in business to make money i'm not mm. i'm not here saying they shouldn't do that however they they're building stock that appeals to investors not necessarily to e even tenants let mm. alone owner occupiers and so it's a very short term view and the person carrying the can for that really is the idiot investor the the unsophisticated investor who does buy that property um now that's in a sense you know they've made various decisions based on whatever whatever information they've they've um they've based their decisions on but the thing is that developer is built to a market now mm. and a lot of people's come come to us and they say oh but they wouldn't build it if there wasn't a market for it i'm like yeah but this is chicken and egg you've created that market because you've marketed it to those would be investors to tell them it's a good investment they've believed you and they've bought it then they've found out it wasn't such a great investment uh, it's too late mm. and a little bit the same with this case you know where you've got builders or developers that are you know they're not incentivized to um, make sure that the long-term 
uh, investment is a good one because they offload it and then there's a period of, you know, stat- the statutory period hmm. that they've got responsibility towards that building and then once that's gone, whatever, they're on to the next, the next project, you know. So the person that really ends up carrying the can for all of these decisions is the buyer. It's not just the buyer. It's actually local and state government get involved as well. Okay. Uh, and that's the surrounding infrastructure. And, and yes, developers pay a Section 94 contribution to, to help fund the ongoing maintenance of the supporting infrastructure for, for these developments. But at the end of the day, the developer's gone, he's taken their investment, gone on to the next project. And 20 years later, the road has to be replaced. The mm. road has to be resurfaced. There needs to be sporting grounds put in. There needs to be changes to, to those sporting facilities. A library needs to be built. Public transport has to be built. It's the local and state government that actually also has to support. We've seen a situation a decade ago, I suppose now, of the collapsing sea walls in frontage up on the... Narrabeen. Northern, Narrabeen, yeah. 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 Collaroy. Yeah, yeah, Collaroy. And councils had to go and fund that. Yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So it's not just new buildings. It's, it's happening all the time. So it's coming back to the planning stages. And that's why local councils are so important in having that conversation about planning and future use in these prop- these developments. Which is a good point you just raised there because, of course, in New South Wales, I'm not sure about other states, you've got a situation where the state government's overriding local government. So, what? yeah, I mean, talk more about that. So at some point, communities need to have ownership and have conversations about the future shape of their, of their communities and what they want it to look like. And unfortunately, the state government has come in and, and played heavy hand, and, but I think the tide is turning back. Uh, because at the end of the day, it is local residents who have to pay for that community infrastructure. Mm. So they do need to have a say in what it looks like and what their future environment looks like. But yeah. I mean, what the local people would say is it's NIMBY mentality. And, you know, what people understand is what makes their suburb likeable and livable and why people want to live there is because of the way it is currently today. And what people will want to do in the future <laughs> is not change a single thing. <laughs> And what that does do is, so if you ask anyone in Vaucluse or Mossman or go around, you know, Sydney, they don't want any more infrastructure. They don't want any more, you know, development. You know, the problem with that's other... a little different. They're there because you know they're well, they're close to the CBD already and well serviced, and there's they're pretty much, you know, constrained in terms of available land and all the rest of it. But you, you're probably talking areas where there's more scope for a lot more residents, like, you know, where you've got a redevelopment of industrial sites for arguments sake or rezonings happening, I would think. Or, or knocking down old buildings, I mm. think. Like yeah. you mentioned nice suburb. I live in a nice suburb and um, <laughs> yeah. I, I like it the way That's it is. good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. But I look at uh, older houses and, oh, it's not going to be long before that one's gone. And sure enough, off it goes. And then you notice that yeah. the, next one, the one next door has obviously been bought because the grass is growing long and it's next. Mm. Um, and up goes the development. Uh, but that's a rezoning too, though, isn't mm. it? And and how much of that is local versus state? I guess that's the thing, isn't it? Because I think I, I mean on that sort of micro level, yeah, yeah. I think it'd be the the local government. Yeah. But then this... it is very much local government. And I'll, I'll just go back and I'll challenge you, Chris, because coming to this podcast this morning, I've come from Dubbo via Tamworth, which sounds a little bit crazy, and that's mm. a whole long story. <laughs> but there's a whole different world out there, mm. and. I have four children and three of the four actually live and have invested in regional New South Wales because it is so much more affordable to live out there. I personally have bought real estate on the mid-north coast of New South Wales and that's my retirement dream and that's where I'll be going um, to get away from some of these problems. So there are other options out Mm. there and it's it's going out regional areas. Yeah, I mean, the... You know, obviously there's, you know, more land there but there's not really an affordability problem there. I mean, where this is, you know... Why people are buying apartments, or living apartments, is they can't afford the house. Mm-hmm. And so what we do need to do is create more livable housing. But you know, you ask the communities in those areas, they don't want to change anything. So it's kind of like what ends up happening is all the apartments basically go to councils where they're willing to build them, and um, then you get start getting the infrastructure problems, which you know you'll mm. see. So we basically just start pushing, you know, all these new buildings into. Generally speaking, it's it's the outer suburbs and outer councils because they get through council a lot easier and the councils want the rates a lot more. Um, and, you know, and so... <laughs> Is he a slightly conspiracy theorist? <laughs> oh, look, I'm, I'm sure. I, I was out in a Western <laughs> Metropolitan Council a couple of weeks ago and, and had a long conversation with, with the engineers out there. And they're part of the Northwest Coast Corridor and they're basically building 70,000 new residences. Yeah. 
huge, 200,000 new people they're, they're coming for in one local government area. <clears throat> and they've got the challenges of providing the supporting infrastructure to that. So the supporting fields, just the road network mm. is to support that. And they've already got a couple of hundred thousand residents who've got some older ageing infrastructure. And they're saying, why is all the money being spent on developing this new infrastructure mm. versus maintaining the existing infrastructure? Real challenge for our engineers. And I mean, on that point there um, is, you know, what are the, if you go and build, you know, six towers, what's, how does, how, what do you do to the sewerage system? You know, how do you, you, cha- you have a very big one, <laughs> but I mean the cost to do so. And then what does that mean for all the other residents? And then, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, we, we just build the towers and think, well, you know, yeah. what do we, what about the electricity? What about the roads? And, you know, that- we're talking we're, so it's it's good that we've moved on from just talking about one building yeah, to yeah. the system like the s- social system around it and at engineers australia we're constantly uh encouraging government to involve the en- engineers in the decision making process now there need to be economists lawyers social scientists and all the rest of it as well but what we find is that often the engineering questions like what do we do about the sewer is coming way long time after the decision has been made to put up the six box in the first yeah, place. Yeah. And this is not, this is for big decisions like do we put an airport, where do we put the airport or do we put a new railway line in um, down to, well, we need to get a dense, we need to densify a corridor around a new light rail. We need to plan for this 20 years in, the, in advance. And what are the engineering solutions that could be done and some of the engineering issues that could be, um, th- that might come up that we need to resolve. And what we've, what we think is that there's not enough level of engagement with people who understand the technical ramifications and the technical possibilities. Yeah. Because if the, to sort of explain what I mean by there, by that, if we're trying to get more people from A to B, oftentimes, like, oh, we just need a, a new freeway. Mm. But before that, let's think about, all right, the objective is getting people from A to B. What is the most efficient way to do that? Do we just actually just rephase the lights? Or do we put in a heavy or light rail or car? Or maybe it is just a, a new road. Who knows? But you need to ask the question about, how do we achieve the objective, not which road should we put in? It's a... Uh, oh, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so but when But that's we, not popular. I mean, that's not headline generating, is it? No, it's not. And yeah. so we've... Each, it, it isn't a headline, but what it actually is, it's actually building communities. It's beautiful. I love it. But it, yeah, I mean, but it, but it's unfortunately our governments are so short term. We talk, talk about, yeah. we worry about property buyers being short term and they're thinking our governments are maximum four years. Mm. You know, they're really thinking about the next election. They're not thinking about anything else, are they? No, they're, well, oftentimes, oftentimes they're not. And um, really, I, I think that if a government is announcing like the cutting of a ribbon of a, of a new railway line, that should be... It, ideally, that'd be a low key event because we all knew it was coming. Like, in an ideal world, yeah, we knew that was coming twenty years ago. Like, mm. well done, well done for delivering it. Mm. But um, mm. you're sticking to the plan as opposed to we're going to build a new railway line surprise in two years' time. And you're like, okay, where did this idea come from? Why mm. do we suddenly need a new ra- railway line? Surely we thought about this for twenty years. And that is so true because I have to say, living in Sydney and and. All of a sudden, there's a light rail going out to Parramatta, go, but there's a heavy rail already going out there. Why do they need a light rail as well? There's this Northern Beaches doesn't have a rail system at all. I mean, you know, like you just go, you're scratching your head thinking, what? Mm. Um, and, you know, and then there's other things like, for instance, the Lane Cove Tunnel when that was built, and then suddenly an apartment building's falling into it. And you think, oh, someone missed something there, yeah. didn't they? I mean, <laughs> Um, and another one is, is like the, the Iron Cove Bridge in Dremoyne, right? Mm. So, you know, for years you've got this silly little bridge that was not coping and so suddenly they decided to build a bridge to the side of it. And that was when I discovered this concept called design and construct. Mm. And it's like, oh, that's how everything's built. What? It means it's built as it's it's designed as it's built. You know, it, I, I mean, I know that that's common and, and you can probably maybe assuage my fears on that, but I just was, what? You know, yeah. wouldn't there be a lot more work done before you actually started it? Otherwise, finding out the problems as mm. you go. And I think that's probably a good example of how most people think of engineers and engineering. It's like you call them in when you've got a specific engineering issue, like mm. how do I build this bridge? But really the engineer needs to be brought in at very early stages to think about you know, what are, what are the transport or, or construction issues that we're trying to overcome and then how do we actually ad- address them? So in New South Wales, we've got an election 
this weekend, and I don't. This uh, podcast we inter- we we record them, and they don't come out straight away. So, so sorry, listeners, we'll know who our next premier and government is by the time this is released. But so there's a new election, and so the state government, and I've seen all these billboards around from the Greens. <laughs> <laughs> talking about congestion and those sorts of things. You know, we've got to have better public transport, et cetera, et cetera. So it's sort of a bit ironic that it sounds like the Greens and Engineers Australia should be getting together <laughs> on this. Uh, yeah, I think so. And uh, she's moved to the federal Senate now, but Maureen Faruqi, uh, until she made that move, was a, an engineer in, in the Greens in New South Wales. Uh, so there is there is at least some connection there. Yeah, there so she, she actually was a local government engineer. Um, on the mid-north coast of New South Wales, actually a member of, of my organisation mm. as well uh, and very active in road safety and traffic management is her specialty. So it's actually great to see them pick it up. Mm. But the issue of public transport is a really interesting one because public transport doesn't deal with one of the major users of the road network and that is heavy vehicles and transport. Mm. Get all our goods around. Mm. And that is a real challenge for engineers to deal with as we're getting higher productivity vehicles uh, our B-doubles and our road trains and our our other heavy vehicles. Yeah. Not just on the highways, we get them between capital cities, but getting them around what we call the first mile and last mile. So when they come off those highways and get to the distribution centres, get into the supermarkets, those sorts of places, that's a real issue, again, for, for engineers to be challenged by. I mean, you can see that in, in where we are, in the city. I mean, Barangaroo, like there's literally big semi-trailers mm. going through the city at all hours of the day. And it's like, how is, you know, it's an impact of that on the community with the light rail, like the disruption of that has on the community to build that is just enormous and it hasn't really been, you know, thought through. I guess um, some of our listeners or some people have said to me is, look, you're anti-new, you hate new property, you shouldn't, which is true, but um, <laughs> that we shouldn't, what's your solution then? Like, should, and I think, well, we still need to build it. I still, I mean, you know, I think we're still going to keep growing our population. You know, we're slowing it down apparently. But, um, you know, we're still going to keep growing our population. Our cities are going to keep growing. We still need to build new property. Otherwise, we're going to have a problem. Mm-hmm. My biggest problem is that we built the wrong stuff and we keep building the wrong stuff. And I guess is that kind of what you really want to change is that you, you know, all your engineers, if we're going to build this stuff, why don't we just build quality? And why don't we actually build stuff that's going to last, that is built to standards, that is built with good materials and does suit our biggest problem, which is kind of families. Is is that kind of where you would like to see the industry move or is it different or? Getting it right is really important. Setting standards is really important. I'll go back to my last trip overseas and I spent a few weeks in the beautiful city of Paris, there was not a lot of new construction. But there's a lot of maintenance going on on buildings that are 12th century, 13th mm. century, 14th century. They're still standing. Yeah. They were built right in the first place, and that's what we want. And they're maintained. With, yeah, and maintained. Yeah. And, and that's important. And, again, to have suitably qualified people, the mm. uh, registration scheme for engineers is crucial to ensure that those standards are written and set in the first place and then adhered to. It's absolutely crucial to having that. So, yes, you can have new buildings, and we do need new buildings. We need new roads. We need Mm. new water supply systems. And as we deal with with autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, our road networks are going to totally change in how they operate Mm. over the next 20, 30, 40 years. Mm. We need to have engineers at the table setting those standards to make that infrastructure work. Yeah, it's a good point. Simon Kushamaka, um, in one of our episodes, I have no idea which episode, but he's a demographer. He's quite well known. He's part of Bernard Salt's kind of demographics institute and he's German. And he's made the exact same point around, you know, the biggest problem we have is we have no middle ring. Um, you know, we've got big towers and we've got houses, but, you know, these big cities like your London's, your Paris, et cetera, they've got a really strong middle ring that's maybe six, seven levels high. And it's been around for 600 years, you know, and it's built by quality and it retains value and you maintain it and you can keep growing your population. That's what we haven't got here. We just build, you know, things that are going to last at least seven years. Right. It's a worry, isn't it? And Mm. so, you know, in terms of buyers who are looking at buying something new, what can they do? Is there a sign that they can look for to give them some confidence or, you know, is there anything? Did you want to answer that, John, first? Oh, I, I would encourage listeners that uh, to do your due diligence when, when you're purchasing. 
certainly talk to your real estate agent and anything that comes off the plan in particular, make sure that the engineers who have signed off it have some appropriate qualifications. Engineers Australia runs a very, very good registration scheme and a certification scheme and make sure that those engineers actually are chartered. If you're not in, not sure, ask the engineer to provide that certification certificate. And how can you find that? Like in yeah. a contract to sale or, you know, because most real estate agents wouldn't know just quietly. So Yeah, yeah. I think what John said about being especially new build, that's probably the only way that it's um, possible with the old build stuff. I mean, who, who the engineers involved yeah, are long gone, right? Yeah. yeah. It's still standing. <laughs> yeah, it's still standing. There's your proof. Um You'd, you'd probably, I imagine the real estate agent probably have to talk to the developer that now. The developer should know who's involved in their project. Um, and it could be one of two things, like ask the, ask the developer to assure you that they use people who are properly uh, qualified. Mm -hmm. And the other part is to maybe even get the names of the companies or people involved and, and check against a register. Mm -hmm. But then that becomes a problem. How do you check that they're actually suitable? Mm -hmm. Now, John mentioned that Engineers Australia has the National Engineering Register. It's a voluntary register for engineers. It has about 20, maybe 25,000 people on the register across the country. And I mentioned before that there are about 330,000 engineers um, in the labor force. So that's not, not everyone's on it, obviously. So 25 out of 330,000. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So in less labor. than 10%. That's right. Yeah. Um, okay, I, maybe I should be a bit fair about the 330,000. Only just over half of those work as engineers, but mm. that's still 170. It's still only 20%. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, so the, what Engineers Australia is calling for in New South Wales is for both parties to commit to regist bring in a registration system for engineers, a statutory one, so that it's no longer just a voluntary system. Mm. Because for as long as it's voluntary, yeah. you can choose not to be on it. Yeah. Um, and then, so, and both parties in New South Wales, like you said, Veronica, will know the result <laughs> by the time your listeners get this, but the coalition has said that they'll introduce a registration scheme for engineers involved in residential construction. So that's yeah. directly relevant to, to what we're talking about here. We're not too sure exactly how comprehensive they're going to be about that uh, registration scheme, but they say that they're going to bring it in so that we don't have to address the Opal Tower report recommendations and the, uh, yeah. the COAG BMF recommendations I mentioned earlier. The Labor Party, and I think John probably knows a little bit more about their commitment, but um, they have also committed to have a registration scheme for engineers. Their focus has been on public infrastructure in, in their announcements. It's unfathomable to me that they would consider not including residential construction mm. related engineers. So I sort of, I assume they mean to include C that as certainly well. Certainly my, my conversations on, on both sides of, of government and opposition, um, Jonathan, you've got it exactly right. Mm. Um, the, the current government is, is there for, for residential, um, but not necessary for the, the other aspects of the, the building construction industry, including public infrastructure, mm -hmm. which is of concern. Mm. Yeah, I think... Um, New well, South yeah, Wales has 180,000 kilometres of road network. Um, we well, we, we have a it. serious road fatality issue. That costs the state government $7.5 billion just in road trauma costs. Wow. Um, and that's an affecting 400-odd families a year with, with fatalities, mm. let alone the 12,000 injuries. And you're putting the responsibility of that onto the actual road design and maintenance and all that sort of thing, or, or part of that? Is that what you're saying? Roads need maintenance. Yeah. Mm. Uh, they need design. And they have to be constructed. Um, they're, they're major issues. Issues well, look at, for, look, for, our, for our community. Look at what um, happened in Italy. Oh, well, bridge collapsed. Mm. Bridge collapsed. You know, that's we're, a maintenance we're, we're issue. Touchwood, we yep. haven't had one of those in New South mm. Wales. And I guess that's the one blessing with the Opal Tower. We haven't seen any fatalities. Mm. No one's been hurt. Um, so that's something we can be thankful for. We've had the warning signs though, right? Mm -hmm. We've had the... Um, you know, the big apartment block in Melbourne that went up, the cladding. The cross. Um, yep. You know, and they've, they've been there. And, you know, those buildings are still exist, you know, today mm. and they still got the same risk. they still got the cladding there. I mean, how, how, how can you go back in time and change these buildings? And what's the solution? Do you have to knock them down or? No, well, no, no they, they, they can be fixed. But, again, you'd want a good engineer mm. to assist in that process. And, again, we want standards to be set and maintained, which mm. is why we've been campaigning mm. so hard for recognition and registration of engineers so to actually in, set those standards. And in New South Wales, you don't need to be a registered fire engineer to, to design the safety systems on the high-rise. Mm. Um, 
Whereas uh, big as belief, doesn't it? It does beg a belief. Uh, <laughs> I can design a road. You don't have to yeah. be qualified. Yeah. It's crazy. It's up to whoever's employing or engaging you to do their due diligence and figure out that you've got the right skills suitable. But, um, but when it's a public it, issue or a social issue, yeah, is that should that be outsourced to someone who's trying to make money? Yeah, it's. I mean, you think about a doctor working <laughs> in a in a surgery. They, the head of the surgery, of course, is doing his due diligence on the staff he employs. But then you as a customer come in, you don't go and check his doctor's certificate. No. no. You, tr- you trust that the system's there. And then if you do make a complaint about That's your right. doctor, you know that it can be followed up. In engineering at the moment, it's, it's not the case. Well, and that's, I think... That's really important for listeners to understand and obviously, you know, pressure your local member because mm. the thing is that we do trust so much. Mm. Every morning we wake up and we trust that our floor's not going to collapse. We trust that our ceiling's not going to fall in. Mm. We trust that the water's going to come out of the tap. We trust that, you know, when I put the key in the front door, it's going to open, mm. that the car will start, uh, you know, that the neighbour next door hasn't had a major blow up with his wife or whatever and going to blow up the whole neighbourhood. I mean, like, you just don't know. We trust all that stuff's not mm. going to happen. Mm. Um, and I think with the engineering side of things and the impact on so much of our, our environment, mm. you know, the built environment basically, isn't mm. it? But with the impact of engineering on every single thing that we do in our lives to not have that... Um, better regulated yeah. is quite shocking. So I think I'd like to encourage all listeners, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'll mm. go to my local member after next week. Mm. Um, <laughs> and, 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 well, and, and certainly there was a survey done last year and it was one of the Ipsos polls and the results came back that 93% of, of the respondents did want their engineers to be registered um, in fact, most of them were surprised they weren't mm. already. I think that's a good, that's a big point, really. Mm. I was, and I'm sure most people mm. are. It doesn't surprise me at all. So who's holding this back, right? So if everyone, common sense, mm-hmm. you know, we should have everyone legislated, we should, you know, have everyone credited, et cetera. Um, but obviously it hasn't happened. Mm. And, you know, and it, well, it's not like we're, you know, just all of a sudden become this country that has thought about this. This is obviously something that's been kicked <laughs> down the road for many years. Mm. Who doesn't want this to happen? Is it the construction industry more broadly? Is it the state government? You know, because, um, you know, it, it actually makes too much mm. sense to to not do it, but someone's obviously trying to hold it back. Mm. Uh, I'll make a, a point of order on something John said right at the beginning. Queensland's actually had it in some form since 1930. 2002 is the most recent edition of the, of yep. the Act. So Queensland's way ahead of the game finally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. We have Queensland <laughs> listeners too and we love you. Yeah. <laughs> it's sunny up there. Yeah. Anyway, so they've got, they've got registration right. It's comprehensive. It's any type of engineering service you have to be registered. In New South Wales, Engineers Australia and, and Institute of Public Works Engineering Australia have been on this topic for decades, I would say. Oh, um, frustrating for you. <laughs> and the argument that often comes back, there's sort of two, two main arguments. One is ideologically the, the parties, both parties, both major parties don't really like regulating yep. things. Yeah, I think it's like more like the same deregulation. Issue with the real estate industry, right. but anyway, yep. And regulation, they say, oh, is it red tape? Well, red tape is regulation that doesn't work or isn't needed. Mm. When regulation serves a purpose and is efficient, then it's good regulation. Yep. And that's what we're pushing for. And the other argument that comes back very often is, oh, but awesome. things aren't, no, not even the cost one. Mm. Um, things aren't falling down. Well, <laughs> Sorry, let's wait for a catastrophe and then we'll regulate. That's right. And when you've got something that is so specialised as engineering, it's not something that a layperson can make a judgement about. There is a, a vast gap in understanding between the person mm. who consumes the service, whether mm. whether that service is trust in just being able to get around in life every day, as you mentioned before, Veronica, or the service is, can I buy that specific apartment? And the person who can actually provide that feeling of trust or that good value apartment. The gulf in, in understanding of the issues is so broad mm. that without without a registration scheme, there's no meaningful quality assurance mechanism in place or additional re, uh, statutory uh, influences on the practitioners to make sure that they are actually stay up to date, have the right experience, don't work outside their area of expertise because a structural engineer yeah. isn't going to really be able to work on the mechanical side and mm. vice versa. So it's not just engineering as a whole. There, there are the disciplines. Disciplines, mm. yeah. Uh, so they're the two main areas of pushback that we get. Mm. Certainly, <sighs> just to support Jonathan, it is that fear of regulation and red tape. Jonathan made a very good point, and 
I'd like to refer to or think of it as green tape, not red tape. A good <laughs> regulation actually mm. is beneficial and yeah. to the community. And, and the second challenge is because the requirements are state-based and there was a pushback in 2011, 2012 through COAG to try and bring a uniform registration scheme across Australia, bringing all the state governments on board was a little bit trying to build the 19th century railway and all the different rail gauges. Mm. So it's been state by state gradually trying to tackle this issue. I think the property market just generally people don't want to regulate, right? They don't really want to get involved and it's just too much of a money-making system that they don't really want to slow down because, you know, they want them to be built. That creates jobs if once they, you know, it creates stamp duty, it creates land taxes, it creates, there's so many things that, you know, they don't really want to upset, you know, the status quo, I guess, and, you know, potentially adding more levels to the way that the construction is built that, you know, they just worry that that could slow things down. It, it, it's it's not actually building more levels, and I guess that's the key point. It's actually getting the levels right and getting the services done mm. right in the first place so it actually will save money, not cost money. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I guess as you say, if it's an on engineer with an engineer's thinking that is looking at this, then you've got other people with their own agendas and their own ways of thinking, then, you know, if you don't have everybody on the table working through these issues, we're all going to yeah. spend years and years and years and years and years trying to lobbying. And I absolutely take my hat off to you guys because you've got a hell of a lot more patience than I've got. <laughs> years what? trying to lobby this stuff through, Jesus. Every week we hear incredible stories of the dumb things property buyers do. Dumb things that end up costing a whole lot of money and or creating a whole lot of stress. Mistakes that can be avoided. Please, John and Jonathan, can you give us an example of a property dumbo? We can all learn what not to do from these stories. My dumbo is fairly broad and it's, it's all of us. Because we've all assumed that engineers are registered. The people mm. who are designing and building everything that we need are actually... Uh, you know, actually registered and there's a quality assurance program in place. So that's a little bit, a little bit dumbo of us all just to sort of let that, let that go and, and yeah. not take any action. And the, you mentioned Veronica before, uh, earlier that um, encouraging listeners to talk to your local members about this in New South Wales, whoever wins from the major parties, and you've got to assume it's one of the major parties, um, they've both committed to some type of registration. So post-election, the next step is well, let's make sure you introduce it in the right way so it's good, efficient regulation that covers off everything that we need it to and it's done quickly. Don't take mm. four years to do this. No. Mm. You know, by the end of the year, there should be a bill in Parliament. Mm -hmm. Yeah. John, you got a Dumbo. Oh, look, my my one is the... And it's a line I've used when I've talked to the politicians that to change a light bulb or a fuse you need to have a qualified electrician come and do that. And in New South Wales, they have to be licensed and qualified. To fix a leaking tap, the plumber has to be licensed and qualified. To build the road network in New South Wales, maintain the road network, our water supply, or any of these residential buildings, you don't need a qualification. Mm. That's my dumbo. Yeah, I mean, it just doesn't make <laughs> sense, does it? You know, it's yeah. not like I'm sure our listeners are just shaking their head, really just thinking, you know, no. the most important yeah. things aren't the ones that are getting, you know, have the highest standards and... Um, you know, right, it's probably going to meet, need, unfortunately, in these situations, a tragedy to happen. And mm. um, then all of a sudden, it'll the priority list will go from number 10 that keeps mm. getting pushed down. And it'll be number one. And, you know, the, the governments will be taking a lot of action on it. But, you know, unfortunately, who knows when that's going to happen. And I appreciate uh, inviting <laughs> us in to talk about this because the first time that we, th I think, that governments really started sitting up taking notice of safety in construction was actually the UK example of Grenfell Tower. Yeah. And that's what drove the Council of Australian Governments, BMF, to commission their own recommendation, uh, own mm. report, which had a recommendation including we need to have a registration system. And that's and, only two years ago. Uh, the, was, the fire was mm. yeah, the fire June was 2017, I Seven, think. Yeah, 17. Yeah. I actually forgotten the date exactly, but couple, but, the, years ago, but reckon, certainly yeah. the recommendations that came back to our governments was a year ago, mm. and they've only last week issued a uh, a plan for how to implement all those recommendations. The plan is a little bit sort of it needs some more work. Um, so the more pressure, more that we can remind governments in every jurisdiction that you know this is a serious issue. Just because yeah. it hasn't happened again in the last week doesn't mean it, it's not an issue anymore. So it's maintaining. Uh, pressure on them uh, post-election and in all jurisdictions. Yeah. Well, look, thank you so much for coming in and, and uh, sharing this information with our listeners and with us. Um, you know, Chris and I have been talking about this sort of thing um, 
in the background for some time. So it's been great to to meet you both and get this understanding of what really is going on underneath. And I think too, also John, your perspective, it's not just the building. Mm. You know, it's yeah. it's the social environment and it's mm. all the infrastructure that goes into joining that building with the rest of the city. And um, you know, and we forget all about that because our taps, everything turns on. You know, and that's so because the engineers are doing a good job. That's exactly yeah. right. So it's a good reminder. So thank you so much for your time, yeah. both of you. Thank you, thank you very you much. Thank you. We want to make you a better elephant rider. And this week's elephant rider training is... Just elaborating on one of the things that John mentioned in our conversation, he said that there's data around that points to seven out of 10 new residential buildings actually having defects. Now, that's enormous. You know, as buyers... Chris and I both exhort you to be very, very careful about buying off the plan or brand new. And in fact, we'd encourage you not to do it um, in most cases. But if you're going to, please don't assume that you don't need to do a building and pest inspection if it's a brand new building. It's really important that you do. Now, one of the issues with any building is water. A big major issue is water and leaks and and what can happen basically if the roof isn't sealed or the tiles aren't sealed on the balcony or you've got a pool on the roof and that's going to leak or you've got garaging and there's a whole bunch of issues that can happen when water is not properly channeled into the right directions. And so that's going to be difficult because, for instance, bathrooms haven't been used, so you're not going to be able to detect whether a shower leaks or not. But there are certain things that a building inspector would be able to pick up on a new house or a new townhouse or an apartment in a small complex. In a larger complex, I think it's really important, both John and Jonathan mentioned, to ask the developer for those sign-off uh, certificates and to find out who actually was involved in certifying that building and whether they are suitably qualified. And I think that's a really important thing to do. But as I said, don't assume that you shouldn't do a building inspection just because the property is brand new. Please join us for our next episode when we interview one of Sydney's top sales agents. We want to find the truth of the market from a seller's point of view now, and he gives plenty of insights there. But also, what do sales agents get out of offering buyer's agent type services? Now, that's a bit of an insight. And also, we did discuss the different skill sets that sales agents have versus buyer's agents. So that was rather revealing. It's not a pure plug for buyer's agents, I promise. Lots of insights in this episode. Please join us. Don't forget we're on all the social channels. We're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Twitter. Or you can connect with us on theelephantintheroom.com.au. The links are all there for you. Please connect and send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. The Elephant in the Room property podcast is recorded at the Sydney Sound Brewery. This week's podcast was recorded by John Risk. Editorial by Gordy Fletcher. Until next week, don't be a dumbo. Now remember, everything we talked about on this podcast is general in nature and should never be considered to be personal financial advice. If you're looking to get advice, please seek the help of a licensed financial advisor or buyer's agent who will tailor and document their advice to your personal circumstances with a statement of advice.